Ladies and gentlemen, uh, session four, Future Proofing India, how do we scale and scale quickly? A round of applause for our chief guest for session number four, Mr. Ravi Shankar Prasad, Honorable Minister of IT and Communications. A pleasure to have you here, sir. I'd also like to request the rest of our panelists to please join us on stage. Mr. Vijay K. Thadani, Vice Chairman and Managing Director, NIIT Limited. Ms. Vanita Narayanan, Managing Director, IBM India. Mr. G. Anand Anandalingam, Dean Imperial College Business School. And this lovely session will be moderated by Ms. Natasha Jog, Senior Editor, NDTV. To give you a little background, of course, ladies and gentlemen, we've had, we've had a lovely morning and three productive, fruitful sessions. But one common thread running through these sessions was the challenge of skilling India as a nation. Well, session number four tackles this stumbling block. So picture this, we are fighting a paradox. Though our 1.3 billion population can theoretically meet the combined workforce needs of the US, China, Japan, and the likes, we have a high incidence of unemployability rather than unemployment. This is exactly the reason for the Prime Minister's Skill India initiative. What are the steps we need to take to ensure people have marketable skills? How are we going to meet the very ambitious target of training 500 million by 2022? This session number four, Future Proofing India, How Do We Skill and Scale Quickly addresses how we in India can mobilize our human capital. And of course, right now it's lovely. I mean, it's over to the lovely Natasha joke. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, skill, scale, and speed. We've heard this time and time again, often from the very top. Soon, 70% of India is going to be under 35, so the urgency to scale is immediate, it's crucial, and it's absolutely key. How are we going to convert all the talk into action? That's what we are looking at, and uh, the minister with us, uh, before we go on, you've had quite a spirited exchange in Parliament and outside as well, sir. I do want to ask you that uh, another intervention by Rahul Gandhi, and they're calling it the repackaging of Rahul. How do you see it? Well, that's your comment. But someone asked me, I said, Rahul Gandhi came in the Parliament in 2004. It is quite exciting to note that he is speaking after 10 years. Uh, good luck. No problem. Uh, and the speaking, the eloquence of speaking after 49 days of introspection mm. has its own meaning. Perhaps a little more homework is needed on that side. Okay. <laughs> well, the point you have meant, uh, when I became the communication IT minister of this country, it was amazing for me, Natasha, to see the enormous change India has undergone at the potential. And as the Prime Minister rightly pointed out, IT plus IT is equal to IT. India today plus information, uh, India's talent plus information technology is equal to India tomorrow. And the digital India program which I am executing, it is more for the poor and underprivileged. I am amazed to see as to, you know, we have got 97.5 crore mobile phones in India. We have got 30 crore internet in India. And the kind of electrician, carpenters, puncture makers are seeking their job through smartphones. That's amazing. Right. So they need to be skilled. And if I can conclude my in initial observation, we have spent too much time being job seekers. We have to become job creators. And to become job creators, we need a skill. Right. That, and therefore, the PM in Quebec in Canada said that by the year 2030, who knows, we'll be supplying most of the skilled people to the world. Right. And that's, of course, what we are hoping for. But Mr. Thadani, if I could bring you in at this stage. You know, when we look at the numbers, they're still not as, as great as they ought to be. There are just over 5 million Indians who are studying vocational courses as opposed to 90 million in China and just over 11 million in the U.S. What's holding us back? Now we've seen the government saying this is their priority. We've seen private players stand up to the challenge. What is still holding us back? So I think <clears throat> you're absolutely right on numbers. Uh, we indeed have, uh, if I was to use the analogy of cricket, a large score to catch up with. 
And I must also say in the early overs, we have not made too many runs. So that's why we are wherever we are. And now we have uh, the next 10 years when we have to uh, deliver right. nearly 10 times or 11 times what we have been able to do last so many years. Right. Uh, it's also not a question of choice because if we don't do it, mm. it will become a major threat for us. Right. The second issue which I want to say is that it's not a spray and pray approach. Mm. Let's try to cover as many people and as many people as we can touch with mm. skills. Mm. We have to make sure that skills are fungible skills are measurable and skills are recognized for the consumers of skills which right. is the employers for that we have to deliver excellence at scale mm. so that's an important point you're making the quality is key it's just not the numbers in fact mr prasad come in here very quickly before i open up the panel even further 500 million by 2022 many people have asked how realistic first of all it is very realistic mm. The only thing is the state and center have to work together. Mm. And what initiative we have taken? Mm. There are 12,000 industrial training institute ideas. Mm. All we are having wooden type of an architecture and, and of course mm, curriculum both. Mm. Now all these by a government notification have been transferred to the Ministry of Skill Development. Mm. About 36 skill development programs are done in various ministries. Mm. All have been coordinated under one. Mm. And the second we have come with a Dindial Kaushal Yojana of about 1500 crores. Mm. We have entire new standards. Mm. You know what is important? I think three things are important. A, first you need to have new standards. From a simple manual skill port to mm. a super skill port. As an IT minister, when I see the people needed for mobile testing, mobile repair, mm. uh, broadband repair, it is a very skilled job. Mm. In fact, I can tell you, one who does the welding for broadband Mm. itself is a highly skilled job. Mm. I had gone to see inspection and I was amazed how much training is needed for a simple welder for broadband connectivity. Uh, similarly, <coughs> ITI courses mm. is always insistence only in the mm. uh, institute. Mm. Uh, I am quite excited to see an idea. I would like the panelists to come here. Mm. Three months of study and three months on the shop floor. Mm. Something like that. Mm. Then you will get good welders, right. you will get good carpenters, right. you will get good electricians. Mm. Because we are focusing too much on the high part of it. Mm. But digital India, mm. digital literacy we are doing in a very big way. Uh, I can very briefly indicate to the people here, we are just going to finalize the BPO mm. for small towns of India. Mm. Okay? Mufassil towns, Bhagalpur, mm. Saranpur, mm. Iduki, like that. There is enough job available of data in India itself, private and public sector. Mm. E-commerce companies come and meet me. Like, Sir, go ahead quickly, we like to use their services. Mm. There you need more training there. Right. You know? Therefore, we will have to take a paradigm shift in the entire architecture of skilling in India mm. in terms of courses, mm. in terms of training. Mm. Therefore, all these ITIs have been brought together. Right. And I think the private sector have a big role to play right. where we have to work together. Right. Where do you believe that the private sector needs to sort of work in tandem with the government? We've seen for the long, longest time, as Mr. Kidani said, a lot more could have been done. Now private players stepping up. There's one view that this is for the corporates. So why not buy the corporates? Take the lead on it. How fair is that? It's fair. And I think the corporates have been, uh, today when we have to bring in employees and train employees and skill employees, particularly in a technology industry that's changing so fast, um, a culture of learning and teaching and skilling is absolutely integral to the corporation. And, and when you look at private universities, uh, whether it's uh, NIIT or uh, BML, Munjal University, they're picking up curriculum mm. that are very much related to future proofing right. as opposed to historical. But I think when we come back and look at you know, India, mm. uh, we tend to take a, sort of a one view of India. Mm. There are many Indias. Right. There is the scale and as the minister said, skilling of a lot of people who require very different skills and then there's a high end. So what is consistent is, and I think this is where um, private has a role to play, but I think it would be extremely helpful if the government laid out a framework right. where it talked about where the, you know, it's a digital platform for mm. Digital India, mm. which has a student repository, curriculum repository, standardizations, right. things of that nature that rest of us can plug in and do our part. Right. Very quickly, do you also believe that private players need to get more incentive, that we need to so incentivize this, this, this space more? Is, is that something that you would think of? 
uh, that the minister can address? So I, I don't know about incentive. I think having a framework mm. that allows all of us to do what we need to mm. and have a level of predictability mm. and a level of quality consistency right. that says somebody from India with this kind of a, mm. you know, a certification or a degree or whatever it might be, there is a, uh, you know, there is a certain quality associated with it. Right. I think helps all of us and reduces the cost of doing business. Right. Focus, of course, being quality. Mr. Anand Lingam, uh, you know, uh, the minister they're talking about three months in the classroom, perhaps three months on the shop floor training. The prime minister in Germany just, just last week has spoken about skill development, the need to sort of learn from countries like Germany. They, of course, employ this model where students are spending three to four days in the classroom, two days there on, you know, hands-on. But the problem with skill training in India has also been the lack of, if I may say, respectability. Of, you know, students and families would rather go to dubious institutions to get a degree. It, it just, it's for some reason satisfying. We haven't been able to really make it cool enough, you know, to have a vocational training, sort of, in, you know, to speak in, in that language. How do you believe one should tackle that? <clears throat> okay, so that uh, cultural change mm. is going to take a little mm. longer mm. to happen. Obviously, you know, there is some respectability in getting a degree from even a third or fourth rate university. Right. And even if you're unemployed, at least you have that degree while getting a skill, being a plumber, carpenter or a welder, mm -hmm. seems to not have the same level of respectability. But I think that's going to change mm -hmm. because clearly there is a huge demand for these kind of people with these kinds of skills. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, you kind of touched upon a, a, a one possibility, which is uh, and this has been practiced in the, uh, many universities in the United States quite well, which is a, what they call a cooperative education system, mm -hmm. where you actually spend uh, half the year actually uh, uh, getting skilled, mm -hmm. and the other half the year getting educated. Mm -hmm. Because, um, right. I mean, uh, th th this topic is such a vast topic, mm -hmm. I can spend half an hour myself talking about this. So just to talk a little bit about, there are different layers. So mm -hmm. we need the carpenter, we need the innovator as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lack of skill for mm -hmm. at, at every level. Right. So I can see a situation where you have some institutions which have this cooperative model, which allows people to go and mm -hmm. get skilled and then also get an education so mm -hmm. that they understand the principles of physics mm -hmm. while they're doing the welding, right. not simply doing the welding as though right. it's a manual task. Right. So that's one thing. The other thing to touch upon something else you raised, um, I think the private sector has a huge role to play. There's mm. no way we're going to scale this up mm. by simply not keeping, mm. I mean, thinking that the government can do the whole thing. Mm. On the other hand, I think there has to be the huge role of the government mm. because if you look at models that have worked, whether it's mm. in Germany mm. or the, the, let's say, the community colleges in, in the United States, mm. the government has provided scholarships mm. to these students mm. to actually get those skills. Right. Because mo right. many of the students who are, you're trying to get skilled up can't afford to right. pay for right. that training right. and private sector is not going to invest unless there is at least a small return right. on that investment right. and they have no guarantee today that the people they skill up are going to work for, for them. For them, right. Right? right. So you really need this private-public right. partnership right. and so the government has a huge role to play right. but without the private sector it's not going to succeed. Right, so you need to go hand in hand really, it's not either or, we just, we just need to go together. What next, uh, Mr. Prasad? We're talking about, of course, you're talking about this nodal body now. We're not, it's across skills, it's something that we've seen across ministries, we've seen across states. States have their own disparities. I'll get Mr. Thadani, but states have their own disparities. But what do you believe is the one thing that is still lacking? <clears throat> First, let me clarify certain of the involvement of private mm -hmm. sector. It is in the interest of private sector to help in scaling India mm -hmm. because they need, need skilled people and always waiting for government incentive. Mm. Uh, let me uh, go something out of the box thinking. Mm. Why shouldn't it be treated to be as a part of their corporate social responsibility? Mm. If I, do, I don't know where is Sunil. If right. Sunil Munjal ultimately in Hero Honda trains 500 people, mm. he's giving a new kind of ecosystem for the entire country as far as mobile repair, is, um, motorbike Motor repair and maintenance is concerned. Right. Therefore, and it will lead to a value addition. Mm. I am telling you, so many presentations have been given to me as to how many smartphones are being used for mm. how many services by unskilled people, mm. if we can skill them. Right. Electronic manufacturing, we are pushing in a very big way, you know that. Mm. We consume electronic goods worth $100 billion every year, all coming from outside. Mm. It will become $400 billion. Mm. We are encouraging in a big way about uh, 20 uh, clusters we have approved in principle to completely, many inaugurations I have done, foundations I have done. 
you need skilled people there. Right. Electronic manufacturing is a very, very sensitive issue mm. from smartphones mm. to LED lights mm. to medical electronics mm. to defense electronics. Mm. Therefore, is skilling, and yes, he's right, mm. or your concern is also right. Jab tak college ki degree nahi ho, beta kya karega? You know, you know. But I'm telling you, the more the profitable these kinds of assignment would become, mm. the more respectability right. they will get. Right. And, and that's a fair point. Uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm telling right. you, when the prime minister says speed is skill, mm. uh, then there is a very element, important element mm. of the prime minister trying to give respectability. Mm. As far as training is concerned, Natasha, let me take this point. Mm. We MPs undergo training or not? Mm. I would love to see a refresher course in governance for ministers. Mm. Uh, I went over the law minister earlier, National Judicial Academy was opened in right. Bhopal or not for judges. Right. Therefore, we need to change our mindset right. that periodical training is skilling, is skilling. should become a right. part of our identity, right. professional or otherwise. Right. The doctors are sitting there, I mean, doctors, right. they go to, to their international and seminars. And they constantly or not. have their right, seminars, yes. I would Dr. like Kalwar to throw is in. There. If right. he doesn't go to international seminars, he will not be up to date with the latest gadgets. Right. So that should be clearly understood right. as to how we need to. Uh, right. Keep skilling as a part of our identity. Right. I think that is very important. Mr. Sadani, to come and in. And I want only one thing oh, more. Go ahead. The standards must become uniform. Mm. They must be revisited. Right. And under the Dinda Lupadhyay Kaushal Yojana, one of the focus area of ours is to give new standards mm. for all the skill architecture in existence, from ITIs to others. Right. There also they can give good feedbacks. Mm. Uh, private sector. <coughs> So, just commenting on skills and social status. See, social status is missing for a number of historic reasons, but if we have to jumpstart that, skills have to start appearing in matrimonial lights, like I would like to say. <laughs> yeah, instead of degrees. So, why would they appear in uh, that matrimonial That could be a billion dollar idea, I say, Mr. Sadani. That's really a good one. <laughs> yes, actually, that's how we realize that IT training helps. Because it starts, it started appearing in the matrimonial lights. Now, uh, why is it important? Because there is an economic status attached to skills. How will economic status be achieved if employers pay a premium for skills? So we have the National Skills Qualification Framework. We've all agreed that as a country, we'll adopt that as a standard. If employers could start saying that I will hire only certified, NSQF certified. Uh, professionals or workers right. or uh, right. executives. Mm. I'm in fact suggesting government is spending a lot of money mm. on promoting skills mm. and I agree with Minister, mm. there's not only government's responsibility, right. their job is to jumpstart the engine. After that others have to take over. Government, if government could say that any infrastructure project mm. which is getting sanctioned or public mm. sector banks could say, mm. you must have certified workers mm. or NSQF certified workers, mm. certainly there will be a social status attached to skills. Right. The minute right. social status is attached to skills, I right. think we'll jumpstart the engine. Right. So basically make it worth my while to get that skill, be Absolutely. it in terms of remuneration at the end of the day or more respectability. We, do you see that happening? Do you see sort of this? It, it, it has to be an all-encompassing approach. It's got to be a 360 degree approach that we're all together on this. Do you see yeah. that happening or are we still sort of in fits and starts? Uh, absolutely. I said, again, there have got to be many things. Mm. One is vocational mm. and there are, uh, the jobs that will be created, uh, you know, if you're an electrician or an auto mechanic in the U.S., you're probably making more than a basic graduate who has, you know, uh, a yeah. degree. Right. So, right. so that's, you know, there's nothing, you, you have a quality of life mm. that's far better. Mm. And, and by the way, um, I sent my child to public school mm. all through in the U.S., which is government schools, mm. and gets a very good education. So there is right. no, mm. the other part of it is mm. you don't have to send your child to private school right. to have a good education. But, but I think as we, you know, one of the, the topic here was future proofing, mm. because one is sort of bridging the demand supply mm. gap and what we need, but the other is how do we future proof? Mm. I think one of the things that we have to do uh, collectively and, and policies will help as well is we cannot have a very rigid education system. Uh, in all of the prior sessions, we heard about make in India. We heard about people need to be entrepreneurs. People need to have a good sense of, you know, if they're young startups, they need to know how to spend money. So today, uh, if I 
I'm rec you know, recruiting a lot of engineers. India produces more engineers than any, any other, other country. country. In, in fact, more than the US and right, China combined, right. right? One and a half million engineers. But many of those engineers have gone on an engineering curriculum since 10th standard. Mm. So they do not have a good sense of basic economics. Mm. So when you look at expecting them to run a PNL, or as we look at a world of data mm. and industries, mm. uh, they don't have an industry context. They don't have a functional context. Mm. So we have to find a way where technology and digitization makes mm. things a lot easier on one hand. Mm. On the other hand, we've got to build an educational system mm. that allows our young people to have better context. I think right. earlier someone talked about arts. Mm. It's, it's really marrying of different disciplines. Mm. So when we graduate our young people, mm. they have employable skills. Right. right. And that is, uh, is an important point because we, we, we keep looking at studies that say that all these graduates that are passing out, worrying numbers of them are just not employable, whether it's you know, lack of practical training, vocational skills, English speaking skills and, and, and all of that. So all of that, of course, coming together, the point that Panita is making, all of it's adding to the complex problem that we're looking at. Yeah, that, that's true, actually. So this uh, uh, skill uh, development or future proofing is one of the most fundamental and one of the most complex problems India is going to tackle in the next 10 years. Because without having the basic foundation, it's going to be very difficult to really be a first world country, which is what everybody is aspiring to. So there are different layers at which one needs to change things. Uh, definitely, I think the university system here is completely out of date. I mean, the teaching, um, first of all, a lot of the faculty are not even up to date with what's going on in the, in the real uh, research or what are the new ideas. They're teaching from books. Mm. So there are a lot of things at that level one needs to change. Mm. But the way I, I, I would like to, I mean, I don't know the, the new policy, but I, I would think of it in, in different layers or different categories. Mm. So we have not spoken, we are speaking about it as though these are skills that you need for industry. Mm. But one of the biggest innovations that happened in the United States was something called land grant universities, where they set up universities in the rural areas mm. to help bring technology to agriculture mm. and to bring good practices to agriculture. So you need skill development even for agricultural, right. um, uh, you know, the, the, to kind of increase the productivity of agriculture in India, which is one of the lowest in the whole world, actually. And so so there are many, many different places where one needs to have a completely new rethinking. Mm. Now, in the case of universities, uh, Vinita, with all due respect, th th there's too many people who are too entrenched, and mm. that may be the most difficult problem to solve. Mm. But in places like agriculture, mm. there is nothing there, really, in mm. terms of bringing technology to, mm. to the wor wor workforce. So that, that may be a much easier place where you can intervene and do some things. Right. Similarly, for skill development in uh, many of the vocational activities or uh, in industry, mm. in manufacturing, I think <laughs> that's still not happened yet. And that's right. a place to uh, attack. Right. I think, again, with due respect to Vijay, it's not in IT, it's not in, edu in, in the higher education. It's all those other things may be much, a little easier to tackle in, the, in right. the short term. In fact, one criticism has been that we focus too much on IT and it's now perhaps time to look at skilling in, in other areas as well. Like, let's go beyond IT a, a, as well. But we're talking about the education system, Mr. Prasad. How much of a shake-up really is your government willing to do? Well, as far as the education part is concerned, a lot of long-term and short-term plans are there. I think he's very right in the kind of wasted interest entrenched are there. But, you know, I always take a different view. Either you change or the pace of change will overtake you. Absolutely, yes. And I very strongly believe it. Mm. Let me say it something very honestly before the um, gentry sitting here. Mm. When computers came in 80s, mm. they approached, including us, they lead jobs. And the pace of computerization mm. started creating jobs mm. and people started accepting it. Mm. Today, no one opposes computers, mm. no one opposes mobile. Natasha, can you believe very shortly we will have 1 billion mobile phones in India? 100 crores out of a population of 123 crores. An amazing story. And that's a success story that mobile yeah. phones is always <coughs> talked about in many in cases, India. in spite of the government and right. in spite of 2Gs. You know that? Uh, <laughs> 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 Therefore, when this time we had the highest spectrum auction ever yeah. in the history of India, 1,10,000 crore, some of the players said, he said, at least now we can keep our head high. This internet service penetration, when the providers told me that we have crossed America, we are second to China, 
I feel that this whole conventional debate of entrenched element, mm. how to take care of this, mm. without roughing the feathers, mm. okay, yes. allow the pace of change. Give the fullest cooperation. And once they will see, they will change themselves. I will see the same You're thing. You're not being too optimistic. I am. Uh, no. You're I'm being no, realistic? No, no. I'm, I'm realistic also. Okay. Because I don't see, I don't need to change the system of education. Mm. That our effort is going by the government of India in a very big way. Because of the short time, I'm not, not going to the details part of it. But when I talk of skilling, mm. I see a lot of new institutes mm. coming for skilling mm. in public private sector. Mm. Model institutes coming about. Mm. Uh, I will have to go to IT. How many good IT institutes are coming in the private sector, mm. in the joint sector? Mm. Similarly, once skilling becomes the order of the day, mm. and once they realize a good skilled laborer, mm. even in a carpenter or a barber mm. or a welder, needs a skill job, you will right. see. Right. You know, uh, yesterday, uh, a very important IT giants of India had come to meet me from Bangalore. I will not take his name. A new taxi company by wire has come in Bangalore. And all the taxi wallas are getting themselves registered there. Why? They have a provision that will get you a soft loan to own a taxi. And the, the way in this good condition you will operate, you will coolly earn 30 to 40,000 rupees per month. That incentive becomes so right. powerful that right. change has started. Right. I think that model, Natasha, mm. is going to work in a very enormous way in India. And therefore, when I thought of this mm. BPO in small more fossil towns, mm. I am very keen to change the face of India. Mm. And I thought this will be the answer. Right. Therefore, I come like that. Right. <laughs> Mr. Rani? So, I... Uh, <clears throat> We were discussing who should pay for skills development. Mm. If you add up the number, six, seven hundred million people to be trained over, whoever has to spend, employers have to spend, or government has to spend, mm. it will fall short. Mm. I think the sustainable model of skills development is that we have to make sure that the economic viability of providing that training itself, which mm. means the student should be paying for itself. You'll be surprised in many states, mm. government schools are empty. And the and private schools, mm -hmm. by especially those underdeveloped communities, you, are paying for sending their children to private school, which right. means an Indian parent values education, mm -hmm. values skill. Sure. So if we create the value chain ahead of that, right. then automatically this will so happen. So you would agree that even while in India, parents will sort of invest every last rupee in getting their children a good education, there's no one size fits all. No, obviously not. Right. No, no. So I'm mm -hmm. not saying... That this uh, is stop everything this, else. But I am right. saying the sustainable also, model. Right. The sustainable model right. is when individuals start realizing value. Right. And right. sustainable model for anything is that right. every action must generate value. Right. As simple as that. Right. Yes, sir, traveling in the entire country in the course of my political activism, mm. two things strike me enormously. Mm. English medium school, mm. even though English may be wrongly written. Right. Okay. Right. And the second is ladies' beauty parlor. Okay. <laughs> It is amazing to see that. Right. And I, I think, think it's aspirational. Right? I, aspirational yes. and enormous scope for his killing right. in uh, beauty parlor right. training. I'm telling you. Enormous scope. Right. I'm just yes. giving a of issue course, to it. Of course, yeah. Because this aspirational India, mm. ki even a little bahu of a village mm. must be properly decked up right. while going to the marriage boarding. Right. I think this... this and if she can speak English, then I'm sure sort of it, it, it <laughs> adds, adds, adds value Surely. to her in-laws so as Therefore, well. his killing has right. got so much of potential of new frontiers. Right. You only need to take initiative, right. and also create the ecosystem for that. Vanita, you were trying to make a point. Yeah, I, I think we're all agreeing that there are many kinds of skilling that we need to do, and there's room for all of it. But I think the one constraint, a very real constraint, is qualified teachers, whether it is at the you know the school level Conventional or at the right. university level right. to to mentor and support PhDs. I think we can say consistently there is a shortage of you know where the, the gaps are mm -hmm. so i think this is where you know mr prasad the digital india platform mm -hmm. uh, whether it's uh, you know establishing mooc platforms mm -hmm. uh, you know massive online courses mm -hmm. because that that mother who doesn't send the child to government school mm -hmm. is not sending it yeah the infrastructure may matter a little but it's really about the quality of teaching right so if you could be assured 
in a village that you're getting the same quality of education mm. that someone sitting in a private school can get because that private school teacher right. is actually delivering that course. Right. And I think this is where things like CSR, mm. if you have private school teachers who can contribute their hours, mm. their time, that mm. counts as, you right. know, and I think there are many areas because if we do it the traditional way, mm. we will never get to those numbers. Right. So we've got to look at how do we be leverage technology? How do we future proof our ideas about education? Mm. And how do we use platforms right. that allow us to scale? Right. Whether it's the full and and Just one thing I'd like to say, right as you said about PhDs. Mm. Now, you know, electronic manufacturing we have initiated. Mm. We've already given provision of big incentive for PhD mm. in IITs, in NITs, mm. in PhD in electronics. Because we need good PhDs in electronics. Right. Right. So I think that is very important. Right. Uh, I think that the yeah. issue is very well taken. We need right. to expand this whole horizon right. uh, for promoting it. Right. When we talk about expanding, Lingam, of course, the, the problem usually comes to the, you know, the same thing as, as we see with conventional education, which is ensuring that everyone has access to the best quality education or at least some basic standard and not fall below that. Right. Do you see the same challenges here as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, I mean, uh, the other speakers have mentioned various ways in which we can f resolve it. I mean, definitely, I think there's a huge shortage of, uh, uh, of people who have the necessary skills mm -hmm. to impart that on the next generation of people who need that skill. Mm -hmm. I I'll give you a little story very quickly. So you, you said a lot about uh, people having mobile phones. So in Bangalore, where we have a flat, uh, we can call the plumber on a mobile phone, mm -hmm. but I can do the plumbing better than him. Be because he comes right. in and he doesn't know how, how to do the plumbing, and because uh, and we you know, know what, I, I, what harm a bad plumber can and, and cause, we're all exactly. we're all and aware. So, so there is a huge uh, uh, thing about. Um, so I, I think I agree with uh, Vijay's uh, 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 prescription. I mean, I think it's a very innovative prescription, which is that if everybody says, "Look, we are going to only hire skilled people mm. to work in our construction site to mm. be our plumber," mm. and also that will not only give us status, it will also allow these people to then become the trainers for the future people, mm. it, th then it, it is a kind of a, a virtuous cycle of mm. continuing to grow the people who will train the next genera generation. Mm. So there is a big, big um, skill gap in even right. training the next right. generation of people. And right. I think that's a very important part. So, right. Now, I'm not talking about the professors. That's another whole thing that, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, point of certification. We're, yeah. we're a country that likes certificates, right? I'm certified in this. And if we set up what Vijay said, I am sure that the number of people with certificates will very quickly mushroom. Mm. Whether the skills have kept up is different. Right. Yeah, yeah. So which right. is where right. I think we right. need very strong governance, a framework, a right. standardization, mm. so that those of us then, then say, I've got someone with the certification mm. can have an assurance mm. that this is an intermediate plumber or this is an expert plumber right. or this is you know a big enough plumber and right. I pay accordingly, but right. I know what I'm getting. Right. So, uh, if I may just add in, <clears throat> and you raised a very interesting point. If somebody has to give value for it, mm. then the person must be assured. Mm. Uh, and if that has to happen, then the assessment is the key. Mm. And in fact, right now, the major improvement thing that we have to do in the skills development process in the country is an independent assessment authority, mm. which is fortunately lying with sector skills councils. Mm. Unfortunately, sector skills councils do not have a legal status. They have an industry status. So if they had a legal status that they could grant certifications, which those certifications could be valued by the industry, since industry members are part of that, then you already have an employer who's certifying, saying, if you are certified right. by this agency, I'm right. good with it. Right. So that's an important issue. Second issue in assessment is technology. According to me, skill India will not happen without digital India. Mm. Because no way can our expert trainers reach, mm. no way can our assessments reach. Absolutely. So yeah. digital India is the key to making anything happen. And like right. Minister said, uh, the mobile phone mm. is a great, great opportunity. Whichever way it got caused, it has got caused. <laughs> is for our good. Right. <laughs> the Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, always says, I want governance on the palm of every Indian. Right. That is what yeah. we are thinking about. This the smartphone. Right. You know, Natasha will be very happy to know that the consumption of smartphone in India is the highest in the world after USA. Wow. Phenomenal. And the, and the use of Facebook and Twitter 
and all uh, Google, mm. highest in India after USA. That way we are highly digitized people. Right. We have just to create the more ecosystem. I see change occurring. Right. So India is waiting to change. Right. Well, I'd just like to open this up to the uh, audience, please. I, I can see several hands going up. Uh, we just try and get and some. And question uh, for whom? <laughs> <laughs> we just try and get uh, the mic across. Sorry, I, I, I know the mics are somewhere for the audience, they're just on. No, uh, sorry, sir, I just may interrupt. We're just going to get to the mic. We do need you on, on the mic. Yep, it's on its way. No, I think you know, the, the entire panel has been talking about large numbers of skill development. But who's going to train them? Nobody's talking of train the trainer. You need large number of trainers also. And if you actually see why our education system is poor, it's because we don't have quality teachers. So are we going to have a similar program first of training the trainer rather than first talking of skill development straight out? And then we'll have what he was saying, you get a plumber who's not even better than what he's doing himself. So I think so you probably need a program which would involve train the trainers first and then do the skill development. We should need to do large scale. Is your question for anyone in particular? Can I get the I minister, like minister to, to respond to that? To the minister. We've touched I, I, upon I it think briefly, it, is, it, but it is a suggestion for action. Hmm. But let us not demean our teachers in Vice such a way. Take the case of IITs, hmm. the finest in the world. And those teachers and the students, one of the finest minds of India is going to IITs, you know. The some teachers of here, uh, after all, have tried to inculcate new tools, new training they, over the years have not. Sure. Once the opportunity comes, I'm sure those who are supposed to train also need to train themselves. The government needs to become proactive. I take your point. Surely we have to take uh, take into consideration. So we do have some several post lying vacant in, in the IITs also. And examples always said that what about the fact that in a country like India, why don't we have many, many more IITs? But you're already rolling your eyes, Mr. Prasad. With, with Natasha Jog of the NDTV <laughs> sitting by my side, I don't want to go into the vacancy in the IITs because then we'll slip into other discussion altogether. <laughs> but having said that, this government, every budget we are announcing, new IITs, new IIMs, you are seeing that. Uh, you're right, because I mentioned that we don't have enough teachers to solve the problem. And I think this is where there are all kinds of innovative technology. Uh, one of the things that we're doing with schools in the US uh, with uh, you know, a platform that we have, but it, less about the platform we have called Watson is, so you can help the teacher design the curriculum based on the student needs. So that if I am about to skill someone, uh, I, as a teacher, don't have to figure everything out. Mm -hmm. I can put in a set of requirements, say, how can I get this person from A to B, okay. and how do I tailor the curriculum? So and I think there are lots of, and this is where I think Vijay was absolutely right, mm -hmm. digital India and technology, I think, is fundamental to right. our ability in, to scale. In fact, just, just to elaborate what Vijay said, we have come with a very uh, ambitious program of broadband connectivity of all the 250,000 gram panchayats of India in the coming three years' time. And I think e-education, e-health is going to be a big, going to get a big boost because of that. And who knows, as Mr. Tarani rightly pointed out, a lot of new tools of training for the trainers will also come. Emerge from uh, this, emerge, emerge from this. Yes, more questions, sir. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Nirupama Sandara Rajan, and question for anyone in the panel. Uh, in a country like India where we tend to obsess over certificates and where the return on the return to education on a degree certificate vis-a-vis -vis salary is much better for a degree than it is for skill, how big of a challenge is it going to be to convince industry possibly to bring pay scales at least at par for a skilled human being vis-a-vis -vis one who holds even let's say a third degree, so to speak. Thank right. you. 
I'll get Mrs. Hirani to respond to that. You're already talking about adding it to yep. matrimonial ads, so. <laughs> yes. Uh, if you ask me, uh, and if you were to take a ready poll right now in the in the room, and IT industry that has been demonstrated for a long time, it was believed only engineers can become software developers, and no company would hire non-engineers as software developers. But today, they are actually more willing to hire uh, the uh, liberal arts, uh, liberal sciences graduates, uh, which is BA, BSCs, BComs. Why? Because they also feel that they have a much more broad-based education, amongst other things, and their stability and the other levels being hired, and the fact that times are changing. So I think the, the issue is not necessarily from the employer's side. Employers are willing to pay a premium if they can see the skill in front of them. And I think the key for the training providers and educational institutions is how do we get our outputs as first day, first hour ready, which means a person becomes productive. After that, it's a simple business case. Right. What you are mentioning is true for a long time ago when people used to say that if you are not so and so, my HR department won't even process your resume. But I think today the employers, maybe because of shortage of uh, skilled people otherwise, are now beginning to look at the value of skills more than the value right. of degrees. This is not to say that degrees are understated. Right. There are roles for which degrees are also I think important. Understanding but there are you're saying the are talent important. lies outside as, as well. I'm running out of time, but I have one last question. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Ravi Shankarji, the way you referred about our software and other way, why not to have our own hardware industry? Why you are dependent on China and Taiwan? For the last 20 years, we have reached the peak level of software. You referred to millions of phones. All are made in China. So why not to have our own make in India the way Prime Minister is keen? In fact, you just, if you would have noted in my initial comment itself, I had mentioned about electronic manufacturing. And this whole make in India has emerged from electronic manufacturing. From LED lights, to television, to set-top box, to cameras, to medical electronics, all these. And what we have given new incentives, namely, if you invest rupees 100, the government of India will give you 25. And we have also op given an open offer to foreign companies. Come, make your plants in India, make for India, and also export outside. That we are doing in a very big way. Therefore, we are trying to change the hardware horizons of India as far as manufacturing is concerned. All right, well, we start wrapping on that. I'm sorry, I'm completely out of time. But last words from the panel, quick, short responses. 500 million skilled Indians by 2022, possible? By 2022, it's going to be difficult. Uh, it's only 10 years from now. But if you say 20 years from now, it's possible. Do we need to expand, um, Mr. Thilani? I think the match is open till the last ball is bowled. Right. <laughs> so I'm very optimistic. Right. IT industry has done it before. Mm. My own company has trained 33 million people in 32 years. Mm. So we are just one of the so many companies. Right. Uh, I think we continue to surprise, surprise ourselves. Uh, Mr. Prasad said, you know, we'll have 900 million phones. And every time we predicted how many new phone connections, we were wrong because it was always faster. So I think it is very possible with the right set of conditions that we can hit that tipping point and accelerate. Right. But it requires some thoughtful work. Right. Last word. Well, Natasha, yeah. this chronic sense of pessimism, <laughs> it is time. <laughs> we must change it. Right. IT is there. Indian companies were reluctant to face competition. China hame kha jayega. Now Indian companies have become the toast of the world. They are purchasing companies. The television industry, you see, as a former INB minister. Therefore, I always say, if I conclude in a sentence in Hindi, if you love gulab ki sugan se pyar hai, to kaato se bachkar gulab ko lijiye. Agar aapko kaate nahi pasand hai, to apni dunia alag bana lijiye. I always believe that if we see things with optimism, Indians are waiting to deliver. Let us come out of, come out of pessimism. That's how I see it. Right, well, that's an optimistic note to end on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking out the time, uh, all of our panelists. A wonderful session with some interesting takeaways and very skillfully moderated by Natasha's joke. Ladies and gentlemen, I now like to request Mr. Arun Myra to please join us on stage to present mementos to our esteemed panelists. Please present Mr. Ravi Shankar Prasad, Honorable Minister of IT and Communications, with a memento. Thank you, sir, for taking our time to be with us here today.
to present a memento to Ms. Vanita Narayanan, Managing Director, IBM India. Mr. G. Anand Anandalingam, Dean Imperial College Business School. Mr. Vijay K. Tadani, Vice Chairman and Managing Director, NIIT Limited. And of course, Ms. Natasha Jog, if you join us on stage to receive a memento from Mr. Arun Myra. Let's have a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. A wonderful session, some interesting takeaways.